both Australian, by the way, and we just happened to be working together in Marlborough. And uh, I also uh, got married about the same time Mark did. And um, uh, except uh, my wife's from um, New Zealand and we essentially ended up, I've stayed in New Zealand and um, Mark's moved back to Adelaide. And so yeah. I've really enjoyed my life over here. But, um, and then Mount Gambier comes in because I grew up in Mount Gambier on a farm just west of Mount Gambier. And that's uh, very close to the vineyard that we're making wine from there. So, yeah. yeah. So, so it's really evolved and changed as we go, but uh, you know, Emma and I just love living in New Zealand and, and it gives us um, a great opportunity to be able to go back there and stay involved in the wine industry and obviously Gus being Australian and Swan, um, they get to come over here and um, you know make some Aussie Reds and make some wine from Mount Gambia which is where he's from um, so you know we just we, we work it in and uh, I get over there during normal times as much as I can and and Gus and Swan over this way and yeah that's uh, how, how it all works yeah it's a, a big team effort um, you know my wife's also a winemaker so she actually made our first wines um, back when we were sort of moonlighting, I suppose, working for uh, other larger companies while we were making um, our Bring first range. wines for Naked yeah. Wine. And, um, and my wife uh, made our first wines in um, her family winery. Um, so we are a, a, yeah, quite a big team working together for the four of us. And um, Mark's wife does um, quite a lot of the stuff in the vineyard on their vineyard and uh, quite a lot of the admin sort of stuff as well. So, yeah. Speaking of, of, of vineyards, just, I mean, the other big part of you, your brand and you guys is, you know, organics and yeah. you actually own and live on a lot of the vineyards that you supply the fruit for. Can you give us a bit more information about that? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Sure. Do you want to start over there, guys? Yeah. So I suppose, uh, uh, core brand Tappy being has always been organic and um, uh, with uh, um, change and focusing on uh, naked wines full time at the start of uh, last year it was more like mid-year um, we decided that we were um, going to start converting our family vineyards to organic over in Marlborough and so initially we were buying grapes in from um, uh, another organic vineyard and so we still do that but we also have a 10 hectare vineyard that we converted to organics last year and it's uh, it's been really great actually we're starting to see some really good uh, more flavor coming from the fruit that we got off it this year and so it's a three-year process to go through and so we're um, now two years into that and so that vineyard will be fully certified for vintage 2022. So, um, and and, um, and Emma's and my vineyard, the Cully Road Vineyard here in McLaren Vale, which is where we live. Um, we are going to, we've been going through the same certification process since we bought property three years ago. So we're, we're actually, unfortunately we only just missed the cutoff for the 2020 vintage, but um, we'll be certified next vintage for 2021 so it's been in conversion now for three years and uh yeah it's like next month or um or the one after that, that we'll gain certification so um so the cully road wines from 2021 um will all be certified fully certified organic as well and then uh from there we'll start, sort of start turning our focus to carpenter rocks as well um so it is a big part of what we do and um, sort of our beliefs in, in wine, I suppose. And as Gus alluded to, I think you sort of get some more developed and interesting flavours. And I think you also get um, some, um, some better resilience in the vineyard as well, like drought tolerance and, and disease tolerance. And, you know, for um, working, and, uh, working in the vineyard, we, we both work in the vineyards and, you know, 
we, we don't want to expose ourselves to, you know, yeah. the, the, the harder chemicals that are out there. Um, you know, you Ooh. can do it safely if you're wearing the right PPE and all that sort of thing, but it's, if you can get a really good result from not using it, then it's all the better. So, and, uh, and we think we, we get a better result. So, mm -hmm. yeah. So should we start with the Chardonnay? Yeah, so we've got three wines for you guys tonight. Um, we've got the 2019 Carpenter Rocks Chardonnay from Mount Gambia. We've got the uh, the Tappy Pinot Noir um, 2018 from Marlborough. And then we've got the um, GSM from here at Cully Road, um, McLaren Bar. So, um, what's the last one name? Yeah, so... And I'd just like to say, um, we know there's other wines in the pack. And if you yeah. do have questions on the other wines that we're not tasting, uh, yeah. feel free to ask them at the end. We're more than happy to ask, uh, answer any questions on those as well. Um, we just sort of thought we'd do it this way because then we've got one wine from um, from each region, from each each sort of sub-brand. So. Yeah. So Carpenter Rocks label, um, the first vintage was in 2018. And as I said before, this is a brand um, that we started um, because it's always been a dream of mine to make uh, wine from the place I came from and where I grew up. Um, my family's been a farming family there for about 150 years. And uh, so I'd be the sixth generation, uh, you know, involved in the farm there. So each year, for the last 10 years, I've been going back there for one month a year to help uh, help work on the farm during shearing season. And um, and then it's also given me an opportunity to keep in touch with uh, next door neighbours who um, planted the vineyard in about 2002. And um, we think it's got a, quite a unique um, terroir, like a, a, the character of the place. It's quite a cold region and it's it's not quite New Zealand cold, but it's very similar. Um, it's mm. probably one of the coolest regions in the mainland of Australia. So you get very uh, elegant, good acidity, um, and it's a, a bit of a theme throughout the Chardonnay and Pinot Noir and the Pinot Gris that we make from down there. Um, it's uh, very much different to a lot of uh, mainland Australian wines. Um, and you know, it's still a very small region and, and we're hoping to, you know, pioneer the region and introduce it to a lot more people um, through the Carpenter's Rocks range. Um, yes. So Carpenter Rocks, the name came from a little beach town that's about 10 minutes um, from where I grew up on the farm. And it's, um, it's got its name because of the rocks are really jagged. And um, when a French explorer called Nicholas Borden uh, went through there in the 1800s. He named um, the jagged rocks after the carpenters saw on the on the wooden boats that they had back then. Um, and yeah, it's the, name. the name the name stuck. So, yeah. but it has it, it's claimed a lot of ships um, around that area. I think there was 13 shipwrecks. So that's uh, hence the the shipwreck on the label. And um, over over the years. Um, we've come to realize that the geology of the place is linked to the coastline because the, the coast has slowly been lifted up over millions of years. And so what now the coastline um, was what, where the vineyard is about probably six million years ago. So it's an old beach and we've got these uh, flint pebble rocks that used to be the shoreline. And then underneath that's limestone and, uh, it's got like a, a flint pebble mixed with uh, beautiful, rich clay soil, and um, it it gives some fantastic flavours. Um, yeah, it is a really unique geology. Um, we haven't, I haven't worked um, in a vineyard that's got the, that sort of geological setup anywhere in the world. Um, not not really seen it before, but you know, if you sort of think limestone. On its own, it's uh, you know pretty well. It's pretty synonymous with, with Chardonnay and Pinot Noir. Um, so yeah, when we when we started down there, it was it's, it's been a really exciting project. And, and as Gus said, they're they're an emerging wine region. It's been around for a while, but it, uh, we think it's 
got got some real promise down there and and um you know hopefully australia's next sort of great cool climate region that's uh, that's what we're sort of hoping anyway um yeah and so this chardonnay this 2019 carpenter rock chardonnay we um it was um it was handpicked in the vineyard it's uh, it's clone 96 which is a burgundy clone um so they've got a few blocks down there and we selected uh this block we think it's uh the best one um and so the we hand picking, the hand picking is um uh, probably there's not a lot of chardonnays that are hand picked these days because the cost is really high but we think that the extra quality you get from it is hugely significant because it means that when we bring it into the winery we can get the whole clusters and put them in the press and just squeeze the juice out gently and that means that the juice isn't getting contacted with skins for very long yeah. and it gives you really elegant juice to make a beautiful chardonnay out of yeah it's a much more gentle way of extraction and you can stay away from some of those skin phenolics and does it if you machine pick it it sits in the back of the truck for three or four hours before it gets to the winery and the juice is all mixed in with the skins. And in the skins, you get these really bitter compounds that make some, some Chardonnays can taste quite berry in the mouth or grippy. And uh, by whole bunch pressing, you, you remove all of that. And yeah. so basically we squeeze the juice out, it gets settled overnight and then we'd uh, rack it off any heavy solids into um, clear juice into a barrel, and then it starts fermenting. Yeah, so it's it's been yeah it's been hand picked, whole bunch pressed, um, barrel fermented, and then barrel aged for eleven months or you know yep. close yeah. close to a year. So yeah, um, and we've started uh, doing some of it as wild yeast as well, and yeah. um, that's really surprisingly it's becomes more fruit lifted and mm. there must Gus, be just yeah just quick mate, what, what what does what does that mean wild yeast can you oh yeah explain so uh so wild yeast is yeast that comes in with the grapes uh it could be uh just on the surface of the grape berry and um when you commercially when you're making wine typically in big quantities to reduce the risk, you would be adding yeast that you buy from winemaking companies that actually manufacture winemaking yeast and they come in freeze dried packets. They're so, specific strains and, and, you know, tailored for certain varieties yeah. and styles. And they isolate them from, you know, the great regions around the world. But sometimes that makes all the wine taste a bit the same. And yeah. we believe that. Um, if you try, if you have a good natural yeast in the vineyard, you can try and harness that to give you a unique character that comes from that vineyard. And yeah. uh, that's what, you know, hopefully you can see that in the wine that yeah. it's reflecting its sense of place. And that's Is really there are a winemaker. Comments, just quickly, there are a few comments around that. There's um, lovely yeah. flavors, citrus flavors, unique taste. Uh, I think they're really enjoying it. Great. Oh, that's that's great feedback. Thanks, thanks everyone. And so, um, yeah, this, this wine, I think, you know, we said as um, it's had about twenty percent new oak as well. So on the nose, there's you know, there's there's definitely some apparent sort of toasty oak there. I think, um, mm. but as Gus was talking about with the vineyard down there and and how we've processed it, we're, we're going for an elegant and sort of a linear style. So I get, um, you know, I get sort of citrus on the palate and sort of broadening to ripe citrus, maybe some lemon curd or something like that. And um, and then uh, it's got a really nice acid length to it, I find, um, which is really what we were going for. Um, even though it's 100% malolactic fermentation as well, which we just let go through naturally. Um, and we've also done some barrel stirring to try and develop some um, some a bit more mouthfeel and a little bit more sort of palate weight to it, but uh, it's got a really crisp linear acid line, which um, which we love. Yeah. I suppose the complexity of it comes from marrying the right barrels with the fruit as well. And 
when you've got a, a really um, straight acid pellet, pellet structure, you need some tight grain French oak. And so that's what we've been using is, um, the, for those of you who don't know much about wine barrels, they come from, um, you know, a few different countries in Europe, but predominantly France. And then there's also American oak. And we try and use top quality French oak because it has proven itself over many years to be the best type of oak for the type of wines we like to make, meaning, meaning the Chardonnay and the Pinot Noir and, yeah. and even the Shiraz we're making. So it just gives you a, a tighter uh, complexity on the palate and it, it, it combines with the acid really well. Um, mm. The We find American oak can be too sweet and it sort of makes the wine uh, too fat and coconutty. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Just doesn't doesn't go well. Doesn't work. Um, so, but yeah, the the twenty percent new oak in there is quite a high amount um, for a chardonnay, um, and that is a testament to the quality of the fruit that we get down there. That it can handle that new oak. If you if you had a warmer climate area and you put twenty percent new oak in, you, you'd all you'd be tasting is oak. Yeah, it'd be just too much for it. Yeah. Um, yeah. So, so yeah, that's suppose that's the Chardonnay in a nutshell. Um, and we, we use a similar style winemaking for our, our Marlborough Chardonnay. And I'd just like to explain the label on the Marlborough Chardonnay. It's, um, that is a jumbled up picture of our normal label, which is the, the tappy label. And that's because the only Chardonnay we could get our hands on was not organic um, in the past, but you'd be glad to hear that from our next release, um, we've started the conversion of our family vineyard to um, organic. And so the next vintage of this will come out with a, a normal tappy, tappy label and it'll have a pink sky in the background. Um, so yeah, that's something to look forward to. Um, so, oh, Pinot, yeah. yeah. Move on to the Pinot, yeah. Move on. Yeah, let's okay. do it. We'll uh, pour another glass. I hope everyone at home is pouring another glass. And um, I'd just like to say thanks to everyone out there for supporting us. It's yeah. Just, uh, the whole Naked Wines concept is just a fantastic concept. And without it, um, Mark and I, really would have never have had the chance to make our own wine and we'd still be working for a big large company and you know it's it's just given us an opportunity to do something we've always dreamed of doing ever since uh, we started in the wine industry and um you know we've we've both worked in the wine industry for about 20 years and yep. it's something that it's an amazing feeling to be where we're at now um so thanks for your support out there it's, it's been great yeah, I I, um, I share those sentiments and, you know, as we sort of said in our introduction, it's, it's amazing to think from 2014 um, and, uh, you know, contacting Mark Pollard and Luke Jack to, uh, to where we are today in, um, you know, making wine in three regions and, um, you know, have our own vineyards and, and, uh, and working solely for, for our own business, selling wine to you guys. It's just fantastic. Mm. And we, we really love the comments you, um, you give us on the wines, so keep them coming. So um, so the, the Tappy Pinot Noir, um, I've always liked to think of it as one of our flagship wines, and it's, um, it's sourced uh, from a vineyard that's um, in the southern valleys of the Marlborough area, which means... If you're in the main valley of Marlborough, it's on the southern side. And on that side, you get a lot of sort of rich, deep clay soils that um, have sort of evolved as the hills have eroded over time. And, and sorry, Gus, just to jump in, yeah. it's probably good to say that, so the Wairau Valley is the main valley in Marlborough and um, it's really alluvial. Um, there's some differences there, but uh, the valley floor itself is uh is like an old riverbed and it's it's really quite alluvial and free draining 
but the southern valleys where Gus is talking about is where people have sort of evolved um, and moved their high quality Pinot Noir production to um, because it's got that clay soil to, to heavier, richer site, um, which is uh, con conducive to growing good Pinot Noir. Yeah. Yeah, no, it's it, exactly. And so the Pinot Noir that we um, have made this out of since 2014 comes off uh, some of the oldest Pinot Noir vines in um, Lean Marlborough. They're about 25 years old and it's an all organic vineyard and it has been an organic vineyard for about 15 years. Um, so it's it sort of gone through its adolescent stage and now it's just sort of hitting its, you know, it's perfect period for making top quality wine. Um, yeah. So um, we get low yields off it. Um, they're, they're sort of quite big um, structured heads and they're all cane pruned, which means uh, the canes every year are cut off and there's new new shoots laid down on the trellis. Yeah. And um, it, the clones in, in the vineyard are um, a mixture of Dijon clones, um, 115, 777. And uh, then there's also one called Abel, which was uh, imported by um, a customs officer in, in New Zealand when he confiscated it. Because it apparently he'd stolen it from one of the great French vineyards. Um, so, which is uh, not confirmed, but it's a pretty cool story. So. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, it's it's a fantastic old vineyard, and we're very lucky to have access to it um, mm. to get fruit and. Um, it's uh, always hand-picked because the vines are old. Um, we can't machine pick it. Um, so we take a lot of care and when we pick it, we make sure the pickers are selecting each bunch to be you know, clean and um, anything that's not up to standard gets left in the vineyard and it'll go into buckets and then we tip the buckets into a bigger bin and they go on the back of a truck and we take it to the winery. Um, and then when we get it to the winery, we chill the fruit down in a, in a big chiller um, for 24 hours to get it to about five degrees so that when we uh, process the fruit, um, it's nice and cold and we're not going to lose any of those fresh fruit characters that you get. Um, to taste a pin noir berry is quite like tasting um, what you're tasting in the wine. It's got quite a cherry a lifted cherry and lots of berry fruit. Yeah. And um, for those of you who probably don't know um, much about Pinot Noir, it's actually um, a mutated white variety. So the the original parent of what we're drinking was actually a white grape, and then sometime probably a couple of thousand years ago, uh, the plant mutated to give red berries. And so that's why Pinot Noir actually looks and tastes a lot of the time more like a white wine in terms of, it's not like a Shiraz where it's got really dark color. It's, it's actually a lot more elegant and yeah. um, it's because it's actually come from a white grape. And that's also why um, there's, there's a lot of clones of it and uh, it's because it, it does easy, easily mutate and um, it's probably the, the most, um, I, I would imagine, I'd, I've never actually counted this, but it would have the most clones out of any sort of cultivated variety that, that we grow widely, I think. Yeah. Um, and also that's what makes it so interesting and elegant. And, uh, you know, I think there's what, four four or five clones that go into this wine, Gus. Yeah. And, um, you know, we, we co-ferment them. Um, and, uh, you know, if you sort of speak to a lot of the great Pinot you know, Noir producers of the world, they, they sort of encourage lots of clonal variation and co-fermenting and um, trying to build complexity um, from single vineyard sites. Yep. Yeah. Because each each clone, so what we're talking about with clone is a, a different variety. Like you have red roses and white roses and orange roses. It's the same with grapevines. You get slightly different variations and some will have big bunches, some have small bunches. And so what what we're getting with 
using four or five different clones, we're getting more complexity in our wine because if you were just to use one, it might just still taste like cherries and nothing else. And yeah. if you can use three or four, it with Pinot Noir especially, you get different flavors from each clone. There's you get some earthier flavors just and just quickly, there's a there's a comment. Um, there seems to be some pepper on the palate. Mm -hmm. Right. Talking yeah, experiences it, that you might get. So I, I get that as well. It's it's more like a spiciness. And um, that's actually some of it's coming from the stems that we include uh, whole clusters. So about 15 to 20% each year of the fruit um, we include as whole clusters and, and some of that spiciness comes from the stem. So when the stems are in the fermenter, you extract what's in the stem and that can be sometimes a bit of greenness, sometimes um, a woody sort of character. And so you're getting some of that from that. And then there's all, there is also some pepperiness that comes from the skins. Yep. And then the other place that you'd be getting spice from would be the barrels that we use. We use French oak again, um, but more highly toasted. So they're mm. sort of more charry and you mm. get that coffee and um, burnt caramel sort of aromas coming through. Um, and just, just quickly, one other thing, uh, another comment here is, is, is it meant to be drunk cold or at room temperature? And if so, you know, what temperature do you recommend? Yeah, so yeah, sure. it's 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 a room temperature one. It is a red one, um, and but I think that a lot of people sort of make the mistake of drinking white wines too cold and and red wines too warm. So it's um, you know I, I would personally recommend something around about sort of twelve degrees would be you know twelve to fifteen degrees would be would be great. But but just sort of a cool ambient temperature room is um, is really where you should be where you should be drinking this one yeah yeah my my general rule of thumb would be the temperature from where it's made and not meaning the peak of summer temperature but just the the ambient temperature so marlborough it's 12 degrees a lot of the time um and you know that's about perfect perfect temperature to be drinking um and surprisingly that's actually what i what we keep our barrel cellar at at 12 degrees um, for aging um, and it just seems to be a really good a good compromise between if you got it too cold it won't let the wine mature and evolve because it's a it's a living thing when it's in a barrel it, it's breathing you know it's evaporating um, and the temperature if you cool it down it slows all of that process up yeah um, but if you have it too hot it's like if you left a bottle of wine on top of your fridge for a month it just uh, it tastes like rubbish after it. So, yeah, um, yeah. So, um, but just also to add to this Pinot Noir as well, um, and just Pinot Noir in general, it's a it's a fantastic variety. I, I I love it, and I love I love making it, I love drinking it. But it's um it's an elegant red wine, but it's um it's amazing how it is also quite robust and it holds new oak fantastically. Um, for for something similar, we'll talk about uh, Grenache in, when we speak about the GSM shortly. But uh, you know, of you know something of a similar weight variety as Pinot Noir, um, that doesn't hold any oak at all. Whereas Pinot can you know sort of hold up to 40, 50 percent new oak and and still have that really aromatic nose. But you can just build some complexity in other flavors with with oak. It's um it's quite unique in that respect. It's sort of a you know, you would think something that's so elegant wouldn't be able to handle so much oak as it as it can, but it's uh, yeah, it's unique. So I think this wine is um, about forty five percent new oak. Yeah. So that's uh, it's quite high on the scale of of wines, and um, it, it it's a big expense to go into the wine, but but we really feel that it's justified because. The fruit, you know, from old vines, it can handle it. It's when you smell it, it's not dominated by the oak, and but it gives you a really good structure and and length on the palate. Mm. Um, so 
So just to come back a couple of steps about the how we make it in the winery, once we've chilled it down and after the fruits come in, the next day we'll get it out of the chiller and we'll destem about 70% of it, um, 70 to 80% of it, depending on how the stems taste. We actually crunch the stems and have a good look at them. If, they're, if they taste green, we'll probably put a bit less in. But if they're not tasting too green, we'll, we'll probably put up to 25% in. And that just um, means that we get different complexity again in the wine. Um, and then so it, it usually goes into a couple of fermenters and they're stainless steel. Um, and it'll go in about five degrees for a cold soak. Um, so the idea of the cold soak is about letting the skins that hold all the color and flavor um, relax and probably over three to five days, we're just making it so that when you pick a skin up, the color starts coming out of the skin. Yeah, they sort of start, they start to break down without the presence of alcohol. So it hasn't, hasn't started fermentation yet, um, which draws that out further. But, so it's just naturally releasing it to the juice. Yeah. Before we and start to ferment. There's natural enzymes in the grape skins and, and flesh that start to decompose those skins. So it yeah. means that when we then warm it up and let the fermentation start again with wild yeast, um, it'll, it, it means that we don't have to work so hard and don't have to mix it so heavily to get that color that is all in the skin into the juice. Um, because initially the juice is clear. So um, it's pin and wire is always a low color variety, but I think a lot of people make the mistake of not giving it that time to let go of its color early and then have to work it really hard when mm. the, the, the alcohol gets higher in the ferment. And that means you start getting a lot of tannin out from the seeds and um, it, it gives you a, a harder tasting wine on the palate. Whereas this wine, I think, um, you know, it's still very soft and supple in the mouth. Can and I, that's what we're looking for. Just jump in quickly. We've got a couple of comments here, a bit of questions. Um, so Ali Hardy just wants to know if you, if you are a wine expert, could you tell the difference between stem spice and barrel spice when you taste the wine? Yeah. Um, I, th I think you can. Um, the, the, Stem spice is more of a greener yeah. character, and it, it when you get to know it, it's um, it's a tighter feeling on the palate. Yeah, um, you can sort of you, once you know it, you can you can see it. It's um, yeah, yeah. Sorry, guys, continue, but that that's right. It's tighter and it's a bit greener. That's that's how I see it. Yeah, more like and then whereas sorry, it's more like a stem. Yeah, yeah. yeah if you exactly. were to, exactly. Yeah, it, you could probably get a stem off anything, like like a, um, a a tree or whatever, and it's got that woodiness about it, but it's a raw woodiness, a greenness to it. Um, whereas a barrel is from an old tree; it's probably three hundred years old, and the woodiness that you get from that, and the spice that you get from that, is more like a clove, and um, can be more of a charry. Um, yeah dried spice and mm -hmm. it's typically yeah it comes across as more drier in the mouth so. cool and 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 just a couple others um bradley gibbs would like to know what the aging potential would be for this pinot yeah really really good um i think that that wine would would easily age 10 years no no problem at all um particularly under stelvin uh, and you know i think with sort of careful cellaring it it would it would quite happily do 15 to 20 years but certainly certainly 10 years nice yeah. one and, and finally um richard ferguson is asking what food pairing you'd recommend all okay. right i i love it with um red meats like uh lamb venison um but i've also had people pair it with tuna um so like um uh, very just seared tuna, um, yeah, right. and so it. The beauty of this of Pinot Noir in general, it pairs with a lot of wines, um, a lot of food because it 
it's got that spice and freshness, but it's also got the structure to be able to handle um, some bigger, gamier dishes. Mm. So, yeah, I, I think, yeah, any sort of uh, meat that's not um, too fatty, I think, would be my, my main thing. Um, yeah. Okay. We um, okay. move on. Next one. Yeah. yeah. Uh, so the next one is our Cully Road 2019 GSM. So Grenache, Shiraz, Mataro, or Morvedra. It's, uh, it's the same variety, just uh, depends where you come from, how you say it. Um, yeah, so this is off our, our home vineyard here, where I am right now, um, which is in McLaren Vale. And we're, um, we're on the southern end of McLaren Vale, which is uh, between Wollonga and the ocean, which is a little town called Selix. So we're up on, up on a hill, so it's an elevated sloping site, um, sort of overlooking the valley. And uh, we... We're looking for a vineyard around this area because we were chasing a, a particular soil type, which is called Curajom. And uh, this one popped up and it's, it's perfect. It sort of, it starts there and gets a little bit loamier as we go down. So we see a little bit of variation, which is quite good in the blend. But um, yeah, we, uh, we chase this particular soil type that's well known for growing high quality Shiraz. Um, and it's, uh, it's, when you look at it, there's lots of layers of um, lots of different rocks, <coughs> excuse me, that's um, all layered again. So what's happened is the hills behind us have gone up in a, a like a fault line has gone, has lifted up. And those rocks over different generations have come down the hill and settled again down further where we are. Um, and what, what it does essentially is it creates fantastic drainage but the soil in amongst it has got really good water holding capacity so the root systems can get down and go searching for water and nutrients and minerals um, quite easily uh, so it's it's sort of it's it's well it's free draining but it's also really good water holding potential um, and some of the better better vineyards in the Clarenvale do come off this soil type which is which is why we we're so pleased to come across it when when we did um, so Mark yeah if you hold up the bottle and show people the texture of the label, the yeah. um, if you run your fingers over it at home, I don't know if you can what see we've that. tried to yeah, we've tried to reflect the um, the Carajong soil profile mm -hmm. in the texture of the label. Um, so yeah, yeah, that's just a little uh, a little thing about the label, and also the the road, the way that it's been designed is that being sort of on a hill and in a little gully, it's it's really quite a windy site. So the road is like, it's kind of leaves blowing away sort of thing. That's, uh, that was our idea behind the label. Um, yeah, and so so this wine, it's a um, it's a single vineyard wine from, from our place. Um, and we grow here, Grenache, there's a little bit of Mataro and the, and, and then the vast majority of it is, is Shiraz. But um, our little Grenache block, we, we love it. It's a really cool, cool little block. It's a bit of a labour of love. They're bush wines. So they're hard work. They're, they're, uh, they're all sort of hand pruned and, and bent over and bent over all day pruning. It's, uh, it's sort of hard work. And then the same with, with picking. It, it has to be uh, hand picked because uh, um, it's not on a trellis. You can't get a machine in there. Um, but, but we think the fruit's, um, pretty great that, that comes off of it. So, um, yeah, so yeah, they're, Sorry, guys. they're quite amazing structure there. The Grenache is, um, probably one of the most upright varieties in terms of the shoots grow straight up, straight up. and, and they hold themselves a lot better than a lot of vines. And that's why. Grenache is particularly suited to bush vines. Um, so they, they look like a goblet almost, and mm. each finger would have shoots coming off it, and and then they fall down to the ground. Um, but, you know, they're only as high as your sort of th thigh, I suppose. So yeah, yeah. It, it's, um, it's back-breaking work. I, I don't know how you do it, mate. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Um, they're 
I don't either sometimes, Gus, but it's worth it. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, so, so, so this wine, guys, um, 2019, it was a pretty warm year here. Um, so with Grenache, it's a, it's a more... Uh, it, it's a more mid-weighted wine, so I wouldn't say it's like Pinot, but it's it's more of that weight. Um, so being a bit of a warmer season, um, particularly sort of late around harvest, we tried to get that fruit off early and keep it fresh and vibrant and sort of get more of those redder characters because you can let Grenache go too far and it and it gets bigger and heavier and and um, and blacker. And, and I, I think that. Um, you know, South Australian Grenache uh, has been around for a really long time, but it's had a bit of a renaissance over the last, I don't know, five years, I'd say, um, because people have changed how they make it and they're, they're sort of picking earlier and, and trying to make more of a, a mid-weighted wine, which is really where it naturally sits rather than letting it get uh, too ripe, over-ripe and giving it oak and, and sort of over extracting it and it, it turns into a bit of a, a neutral red wine. So that's hopefully what we're trying to, to not do with this one. Um, so, so this is a blend guys in, obviously it's a GSM. So it's about 65% uh, Grenache. So it's very Grenache dominant. So well, the reason with that is that when you sort of smell it, we, we want it to be more aromatically Grenache. Um, so, you know, I, I see some particularly Shiraz in there as well, but uh, it's, um, we, we want that red fruit character, the sort of cherries and raspberries on the nose rather than the sort of the darker fruits from the Shiraz. And then the Shiraz, uh, which is um, just from the, from the adjacent block, um, we picked that at a, at a similar time. So, so how it's, how it's done in the winery is we, we'll pick Grenache separately and then we pick the Shiraz and then the Shiraz is usually done in about two or three fermenters as well. Um, and then all those batches are kept separately. So the, the Shiraz is treated quite differently to the Grenache. We're being really gentle with the handling of the Grenache. Um, and then something interesting about Grenache is that we, we, don't, uh, we don't use any oak with it. And, we, that's not a cost-saving measure. It's that we don't want to use oak with it. We think that it uh, um, it just it doesn't sit well with the wine. It, it doesn't hold oak well at all, um, and it just loses that freshness and that brightness of, of red fruit. So uh, um, so that's what we've sort of gone for there. And then the Shiraz, when you, when you taste it on the palate, it just gives that that length and structure and just a bit of richness, um, uh, which is just sort of a, a bit more of a developed and darker character, I suppose. Yep. So the, um, a lot of you guys probably wouldn't realize, but the, the Shiraz would ripen, uh, or does ripen slightly earlier. Yeah. So we picked that probably say in the first week and then yep. probably two weeks after the Grenache would ripen. Yeah, something like that. Yeah, about two yep. weeks. So, um, you, you, you've sort of, um, it's good because it spreads out the harvest for us in the vineyard. Um, but the the Grenache just needs longer on the vine to evolve the characters. And even though we're picking it at a similar sugar level, um, it's a variety that just takes longer to ripen. Yeah. Um, and the, whereas the Shiraz ripens earlier and um it gets a higher sugar level faster and we have mm. to be careful with the shiraz that when we get those really hot days like you do in mclaren vale that it doesn't get too ripe um too quickly yeah so yeah mark's constantly monitoring the weather during harvest and he'll see a hot day coming and if it's getting close we'll schedule a pick in before it gets to that really like 40 degree day yeah. to try and retain that freshness. Um, and, and and sort of just on that, like some, something about this wine, the Shiraz that's in this is also the Shiraz, which is in our Cully Road um, straight Shiraz. So we uh, will ferment it in about three fermenters and then it's kept in, in separate batches, but we pick through the barrels um, and pick the, the barrels of, of that Shiraz that we think uh, fits this blend best and also fits the, the straight Shiraz best. So, um, 
yeah, so that so that block we we take about half of it for what is the Cully Road GSM and our Shiraz for Naked, and then um, and then I sell the rest to um, to, to Penfolds actually. So I think the yeah not 2019 the the other half of that vineyard went into 389. So um, it's yeah. pretty smart Shiraz. It, it's uh, a very special vineyard, and I think um, you'll probably see some some amazing wines come off that in the future as you know now that mark's been running it for three years organically it's starting to really the flavors are just getting more and more every year and i think you'll find that the shiraz um particularly will be one that could age for 40 years um it's it's a very special vineyard so yeah and and it takes time to learn a site i think as well doesn't it so yeah you know you sort of uh you, you make a few mistakes and learn along the way and uh, and just sort of get to know what it what it likes to do as well. Just exactly. quickly, a few, a few comments from, from the floor. Um, uh, lots of people enjoying it. Absolutely very smooth, very soft, great structure, et cetera, et cetera. Um, Katie Wikes would like to know if... Um, the, the, the soft tannin was due to the location or the Grenache... Yeah, probably more, um, probably more the Grenache being Grenache dominant. Yep. Um, and also, Roger Hadgraf is inquiring about the Mataro. You left that off the uh, description. Sorry. Yeah. So the Mataro, um, Mataro can be sort of a bit meaty and it um, and and savoury. It some, it's sometimes meaty. People call it meaty. I don't know if it's necessarily if I call it that, but it's a it's quite a savoury variety. So. So it's only about five percent of the blend, um, but but we put it in there because we think it gives us some of that savoury character. So we get that sort of red fruit from the Grenache, and then we get some structure and some some you know heading along those darker lines uh, from the Shiraz, and then we probably get some savouriness from from that little bit of Mataro. And it's it's quite interesting that you know you would think that it's it's um, you know five percent is not a lot, but when we're putting these blends together, um, uh, you know, you, you can certainly see the difference with and without it. Um, and we think it just, just adds a little bit of complexity. Yeah. I think it also really separates because we also make a, a Grenache, hundred percent Grenache. And that is, a, a, it's really bright and fresh and uh, lighter bodied, um, but it's, it's all fruit. And yep. the GSM has a good balance. You know, it's not all the way to a Shiraz where you've just got, you know, really big mouth feeling wine um, that's black currant and loaded with fruit. The GSM sits in the middle. It's not fruit dominant, but it's it's got complexity with, with smoke that comes from the Shiraz, but also this Mataro influence tones down that fruit tone and I think it makes it better with food because it sort of goes with more food uh, because mm. it's not overly fruity so yep. um, yeah yeah well, guys I, th I think um, that's some great <laughs> descriptions of all the wines thank you very much um, we have a poll which um, will be coming out so it'd be great great to hear what all of you think um, vote on which is your favorite of the three wines yeah, right. should have appeared on the screen now, and you can um, vote. Oh, even we get to vote. That's awesome. <laughs> right. Can you tick all of them? I don't think so. No, I don't think so. <laughs> you shouldn't be able to vote. You're a you're a, you're a host or a panel. Yeah, I'm not. I'm not voting. Oh yeah, <laughs> come up, but we're not allowed to press it. So, <laughs> what were you going to vote for, mate? <laughs> I'm not telling you. <laughs> Just some other other questions here. Um, Claudia Long is interested to know if any of your vineyards, Australian vineyards, were affected by the bushfires this year. Yeah, um, luckily no. So um, here in McLaren Vale, we, uh, we we got away with it really luckily because um, our neighbours just up in the hills, not far away, they um, they had a really tough year of it. It was you know horrible for them up there. Um, uh, so it's awesome for you know 
people to be supporting the Adelaide Hills. And I think there's been a big push for people buying Hills wines, which is great and I really encourage it. But um, luckily, no, we, we had smoke around, um, but it was early in the season. So there was big fires on Kangaroo Island, which is quite close to us here. And uh, there was a few days that it came over, but it was really sort of high atmosphere smoke. And uh, there was a lot of testing done in, in the Vale. You can, you can take grape samples and get them sent off um, to test for presence of smoke. And uh, we, we did that all across the Vale and a lot of wine companies did. And yeah, the Vale escaped it, which is great. And then down in Mount Gambia, again, we, we got lucky. There was, there was no fires or, or smoke as such down there. Um, so, yeah, not, not far from us and, you know, all up the East Coast as well. There's, you know, it's been a, a really, really tough season for, for people heavily affected. But um, luckily, not us. We got away with it. Awesome. Um, just quickly, Peter Doyle, I believe he's one of the Outshrow clan. Oh, uh, yeah. Yeah. <laughs> um, Dozen. He's asking, have you picked all of your vintage from all three regions? Yes, we probably finished picking about uh, four weeks ago or three weeks ago in, in New Zealand. Uh, last pick was the Sauvignon Blanc and um, that came in. I think a, a lot of people over here panicked with the COVID lockdown coming in and um, we, well, yeah, I don't know whether it was foolish, but we refused to pick until it was right and we are probably... Uh, probably in the last uh, week of picking for people over here. So, um, but it was perfectly right, and uh, it's really looking really good in tank. So, but yeah, good to have it all off, particularly. And, and that same week, I think I think we picked the Pinot Noir in um, um, for the Carpenter Rocks in Mount Gambia. Correct. The same week, yeah, within within a few days of that. So we sort of finished up about the same time. Yeah. Yeah. No. It's, it's yeah, good to have it all in the tank, that's for sure. Fantastic. I think we've got the results. Um, so let's see which is the most. Well, there you go. The GSM. There you go. Well done. It's a it's a that's beautiful cool. wine, that one. But a pretty but a pretty even spread as well. So pretty close, pretty close. Yeah, yeah. pretty close. Yeah, which is really which good. Is great. It means that you know you guys like all our wines, which is awesome. <laughs> no thanks for for listening everyone out there um yeah now mark you had a, a bit of an announcement yeah not not an announcement actually i just um talking with with pole and the, the naked team during the week trying to set up this webinar uh they asked me to not announce it but ask you all a question of who the next Naked Wines winemaker is going to be. So I actually don't have the script in front of me, but I'll, uh, I'll try and remember it. <laughs> so you can see if you can guess who it is and um, on all the Naked socials, um, share it around and, and see if you can guess who it is. So he's a Brizzy guy and a, re a renowned wine judge around the country, um, like the Australian National Wine Show. Um, and is now involved in making some really interesting, funky wines coming out of South Australia. So see if you can guess who that is. And I'm presuming, Paul, you can correct me if I'm wrong, but it's going to be revealed soon. Very soon, yeah, that's right. Yeah, it's exciting times. It's always, it's always great to bring, uh, bring on more winemakers, so it's, uh, it's always exciting. Look yeah. forward to it. Yeah. Well, thank Thank you very much, guys. Um, it was be, it's been a pleasure. It's been very informative. Lots of lots of great information on on all of the wines and just wine in general. So thank you very much. Yeah, thanks, Paul. Thanks for organising it, and thanks to the Angels. Thanks for your continued support. We we couldn't do it without you, and um, it's it's fantastic to be able to do things like this and, and interact with you. Thanks for all the questions. Yeah, and um, thanks from New Zealand, everyone. we you know we're really so um, lucky to be making wine for you guys and getting all the great feedback. So uh, please keep supporting us and, um, and follow us as well if you aren't already. So um, yeah, we'd uh, be glad to hear from you in the future if you have any questions, just uh, post on one of our wines. Awesome. Okay, cool. Great. Thank you very much. See you later, everybody.
Thanks, guys. See you guys.